Uh, we are in studio with the Senate President Craig Blair. Good morning, Craig. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having <laughs> me on today. Does everybody remember the biscuits also that they used to have? Yeah. Uh, the, the, that's what I were can, the biscuits? They, they had. Uh, I don't know what they were called, but they were like nutritional crackers that they had for the nuclear fallout shelters, oh. and they would had cases and cases of them. It took, I can remember them at Hedgesville Elementary yeah. and Hedgesville Middle School now, but it was high school when I was there. Weren't they Unita biscuits? I think that was the brand name. Is it like Unita, Unita biscuits? Well, I think it was Unita was the brand name. I think it was Unita brisket biscuit yeah. i don't remember the name on but it looks like those little breakfast crackers yeah. that yeah. You, you could get the belvitas yes yeah yes mm. yeah. and yeah. they tasted like sawdust <laughs> but they had some <laughs> nutritional value <laughs> but hey oh, I had some after your face has been melted by a nuclear yeah. war yeah. a biscuit doesn't matter what that's it tastes right. like that's the least easy to chew with you don't when you don't have teeth right so. yeah not a big deal uh craig uh we uh, had senator uh eric tar on this morning to get a bit of a glimpse of to uh, the month of March and where we are fiscally with this uh, this government year. And I know I, as, I, as I see the projections, we're on pace for a budget surplus this year of over $700 million. Is that how the math works out? Yeah, that's accurate. And uh, I think it's actually going to be a little bit better than that. February was a rough month. I think that we were like $35 million underwater for that month, but then we bounce back. And t some of it has to do with when the revenues come in mm -hmm. and get reported. Uh, but we're back on track of, and this is one of the things on how working off the flatline budget, how we go through our budget process now, that it's a little bit more predictable. Of Hopefully after we get through the May special session, of uh, that we will have actually done two other things too, and that is, is the, take the triggers off to where the money goes into the rainy day fund. Our rainy day fund, I think, has $1.26 billion, and then there's another $460 million of setting into the personal income tax reserve fund, which is basically, let's call it rainy day C. Uh, it's not, uh, but that's resources that we could actually utilize somewhere into the future if we needed to. Uh, but we're on track. Of to being able to get things right. Look, I, I got to stress this enough. I, mm -hmm. I listened to um, Mac Warner just a few minutes ago, and he was talking about all the surpluses. Uh, the surpluses are both real and an illusion. And the reason for it is, is that what we're doing is that base spending is in the general revenue budget. And then when you're able to hold a flatline budget, control your spending, you normally have about 3% growth in your revenues. And that equates into being about $147 million. If you can hold yourself as flat as possible, then that accumulates. And when that accumulates, then you're able to use that while you're working towards your tax reduction or whatever it may be. And that's what we, how we ended up in the role that we did of – is because we had four years of basic flatline budget and it generated $650, $700 million. And that's how we were able to give the taxes back to the people of West Virginia. When you look at the severance tax, for instance, it's volatile. It goes from really, really high. To, that's how we ended up with $1.8 billion uh, because $900 million of it was the severance tax. It was about last year. Yeah, year, right? the previous year. Yeah. Uh, that, but severance tax is really low this year. And so d d what we're doing is in our, our base budget, we're holding our severance tax collections to a real number, a low number of $250 million. What that actually does, though, by controlling your general revenue budget to base spends, you have these excess revenues, and you can build off them and do deferred maintenances do one-time expenditures, do capital improvements, do investments in yourself. And th that's still going to be there the following year, that excess revenue, if you held a flatline budget. And by doing that, it allows you to go in and do big things. Of uh, And yes, we've got it set up. That's the other trigger that we need to addre address is the personal income tax reduction. It's set up for a triggering mechanism. And that trigger of takes place in July 1st. And that's a problem with dealing with 
a budget in a 60-day session. And we're going to get ready. The speaker and I have agreed, and those of us that are know the numbers and everything, want to move that out one year so that when you're going through your budget process in the 60-day session, you know with predictability on what it's going to be. Right now, we can't tell you whether there's going to be a 10% reduction, a 0% reduction of in the personal income tax at this point in time. In May, we're going to have a little bit better idea. But it was a, a flaw in what we did of on managing it. We thought that we were doing the right thing for the safe part of it. But what we didn't calculate in is how we've went from doing budget week or doing the budget outside of the 60-day session to where we've been doing it in the 60-day session. And I'd like to add to it that I, I'm the one that started that. When I was the finance chairman, I said, we can do this. We can actually do the budget in a 60-day session. We just get the bills that have a cost associated with them done before day 48, something like that. And then we have a predictability on what's going on, and we're able to get that across the finish line. It's worked very well, so well that it's expected now. And I'm proud of that because it saves mm, between three and six hundred million dollars, or three and six hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, a year by not going into those special sessions, the budget sessions is what they used to call them. Senate President Craig Blair, our guest on the program. A uh, couple of notes, uh, I guess I should address this before we go any further along the way here. Uh, it's an interesting time of the year because with people running for re-election and we're in a 60-day window, people are wondering, you know, is this a campaign appearance? Is, is the same with Mac Warner. People wanted to hear more about what Mac's platform for governor was. Mac wanted to talk about May 14th primary. He requested time on the program to talk about the May 14th primary. That's the reason why most of that interview was set up around mm -hmm. what, what are the deadlines for the for voting and absentee ballots, that sort of thing. There will be another time when we talk about Mac's full campaign. Same with this. We've been doing this with Craig since he's been in, as a Senate president and then previously the finance chair at the end of the session. We go through the session with Craig. This is not a campaign appearance. So if you're, if you're expecting us to be asking Craig campaign questions, we're really not doing that in this interview. This is really about the legislator legislative session that just finished. So just understand what the priority of this interview is before we go further. Yeah, and probably somebody's thinking, well, the session finished a month ago. Well, the governor just got done finishing his vetoes, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to hold off Correct. on coming in and mm -hmm. having conversations about what went on uh, is because there were things vetoed, like the vaccine bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to talk about that one, I'm ha there, there's a whole story to that. Uh, but, the bill or the uh, veto? Well, the, the, not so much the veto. The veto was somewhat expected of, I wish you wouldn't have vetoed it, of, but it's the reason, let's, let's back, can I talk about, nobody's asked me the question, but let's talk about the vaccine bill. The vaccine bill has been a problem for several years, and like 44, 45 other states have exemptions for vaccines. In West Virginia, uh, we do have some problems. First of all, and this bill didn't address it, was the medical side of it. And there's like five medical exemptions that's given for vaccines a year. I know it's got to be more than that. There's got to be more kids in our state that have leukemia or some childhood disease that warrants them not getting the vaccine. Five is too low. And I've been working on this for a couple years, but uh, this past November, December, something like that, I had uh, my staff actually call and pretend that they wanted to get a vaccine for a child. To this day, we've never talked to anybody. There's a problem with that process, and we've been working on a bill. Who did they call? Hmm? Who did they call? There, there, there is a person that's in charge of that. I don't remember the name of the agency, so to speak, that, can, that does that. But there's a person that manages granting that exemption and can't get through to them. So that's why the five is so low. And I know that the, I can tell you right now that if the Senate President's office couldn't get through to that to have a conversation, then imagine the parents that's got a child with leukemia or some associated disease that deserves to have a vaccine. 
But that wasn't even addressed in this bill. Okay, and, and I, I sort of wanted to put it in there, but things were tenuous. Why? Because our caucus was divided right down the middle on the vaccines. And there's, again, there's 44, 45 other states that grant that. When this bill was finished, it was the grand compromise, in, in my opinion. Uh, and the compromise was is this bill made it so that uh, if you were t t uh, attending school online, virtual, you were exempt from getting the vaccines, just like a homeschooler doesn't have to get the vaccines if they're not into the public school system. And then if you wanted to have a parochial school, a private school, and say that there was no vaccines, that was okay, too, because they weren't entering in the public school system. But nowhere else uh, did it apply to that. I can almost tell you that the private schools that I've heard and talked to, there probably wouldn't have been two of them in the state of West Virginia that would have exercised that bill. So, in effect, you would have had the kids that were virtual, not needing to be vaccined, if they chose to, and this is somewhat of a parental right thing also. But when it comes to the public schools, if you put your children in the public schools, and the vast majority of the private schools are still going to have it, they would have still been required to get the vaccines. And so this whole vaccine thing, I like getting issues off the table, getting a compromise, a solution for what's going on. And by the governor vetoing this, um, it made it so that it, it's going to be an issue next year. And you never know. But it's better to solve a problem right then and there if you're capable of getting that across the finish line, which we did, rather than to kick that can down the road and do it again next year where it could be worse either direction. As a practical matter, what happens if – it's been a long time since I had a kid in private school or public school <laughs> – if so, this happened. It's vetoed. The law says I have to have my kid get vaccinated to mm -hmm. go to public school, and I just say no, I'm not going to do that. And I send my kid to public school, and I don't get him vaccinated. They're not going to let him in. That's correct. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it anyway. So I can't. He can't be truant. So what happens? Homeschool. Th okay. That, that's your option. Uh, but if the law says I I can't. The law says I have to get them vaccinated anyway? You have to meet the criteria of the law saying that you have to be vaccinated. So all kids need to be vaccinated, period. In the public school system, correct. And, and actually in the private and the parochial school and in to the virtual school. To but homeschool As not. it is now. But to, homeschool not. At homeschool not. Okay. That's correct. All right. I see. And so Look, I get both sides of it, of, of the issue. And we also knew, I know two people throughout my life that had polio. Uh, Larry Faircloth just sure. won. Recently and passed he away. Was all, he was a vaccine guy. He was 100% in support of that. And another one is a gentleman named Larry Swan until my daughter was elected. Uh, he was the youngest person ever elected to a legislature in the West Virginia. And uh, so, and Larry, I, I still know him, and he walks with the, the braces and the mm -hmm. crutches and, and all that. And he, he again, is an advocate for the vaccines. Um, you know, I often thought that, you know, why are we so concerned about it? Because if your child's vaccinated and another child's not, the only child that is at risk is the child that's not vac vaccinated. But remember me talking about the students with medical issues. If they're not vaccinated and they're coming into the public school system, in a lot of cases, of they don't, you got health issues, you can't afford a private school, you can't afford to do a lot of different things, and you're going to put your child into the public school system, and that's where well over 90% of our students go anyhow, then they go in and the very child that you're trying to protect their life and their health by not vaccinating them, you're putting them into an arena where they 
have the potential to be able to get it because there's other kids that's not vaccinated, so mm -hmm. it's not a safe place for them. There's a lot of variables that come into play on trying to be able to do this. And then it also has to do regionally. Some areas of the state are way more rural, so the vaccinations are t seem more uh, intrusive to them, right? more against the parental's rights to choose. Uh, then when you get into the more urban areas uh, of the state, the, then they become more in, in favor of the vaccinations. Speaking of parents' right to choose, and we go back and forth on this all the time, Craig, and this has to do with the transgender issues in the state and legislation involving transgender issues in the state and chemical castration. Uh, because this has become uh, a hot button issue of discussion over the last couple of months. Explain that bill to me and the votes as the as they progressed, because this was this bill was what I pretty overwhelmingly passed in West Virginia. Can you explain how this came about and the positions on it? You do understand that that bill wasn't this year. Yeah. OK, because we're going outside the arena to going into a campaign. Of thing. Well, I don't think we talked about it with you last year, though. Okay. Um, and it, it, I'm, I don't don't I, make it a campaign issue. Just a, a, explain exactly how the mechanics of the of the bill work. Okay. I, I, I'm, I just try to stay within the guardrails <laughs> of where we're going. Of uh, first of all, when when it comes to the um, chemical castration, is not an accurate uh, description of what's going on. Of, and what they talk about is what's called a Tacuba Amendment mm -hmm. to the bill. And uh, we've uh, what went into that was is that made it so, I hope I get all this right, that it has to, you say you got a child that's suicidal or highly suicidal that is willing to hurt themselves or, or capable of hurting themselves or others, that two doctors and the parent get to make the decision on whether a child can get puberty blockers or things that um, medication that will, t t in some cases in higher dosages, it will allow a child to transition from a male to a female. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's the argument that they're making on that. But it's very, very specific in, in the um, Tacubo the Amendment that it can, two doctors and the parents have to agree to it, and you could not use enough of that medication to allow the transitioning to take place. Okay, so it's, in other words, it's a low dosage of that. And so the, it's not, there, in West Virginia, it's actually illegal. And far as I know, there's zero cases out there of where any of this is taking place of on that now they'll say that well you can get two doctors together to be able to to agree to doing this of on that but once again that these are doctors that when i let me back up for a minute if i go into a doctor's office i normally try to do what the doctor tells me to do i'm not telling the doctor i don't go doctor shopping for what i want and i really don't think that there's a lot of parents out there or let me change that. Any parents out in West Virginia that are going out there looking at saying, I wanted a little girl and I got a little boy and I'm going to try to transition my child to being something different. That's not happening. And so the, the, I voted for both the amendment because it made sense. And I'm not a doctor. Of, and I listened to the information that is put forward, and then I put myself in the parent situation. If you were in something like that, you got a suicidal child for whatever reason, and you got to say to yourself, are you going to do what helps the child, what makes the child's life better, actually the family's life better, or are you going to let the state of West Virginia uh, for, to create something saying, no, these drugs were taking them out of your tool bucket and you're not going to be allowed to use them in any way. 
that is not a role of the legislature. Okay, that that is just not the role. Fentanyl. You've, I've been on this show and said that I wanted capital punishment for fentanyl. But the fact of the matter is fentanyl is used in the hospitals and it's used for specific purposes of, that, that can actually help heal people on what's going on. But it, it's also a purge in our, or a scourge in our society mm -hmm. as well because it's being used outside that scope. So I, I hope I explained that well enough of, from that standpoint. And it's like, gee, I, no, I can't respond any further than that because now I'm getting outside yeah, the garden. I, I wanted to understand the law more so than I wanted. I, again, I, didn't want to, I don't want to get into campaign issues in this interview. So I, and I appreciate you walking the line on that. Yeah. All right. Hey, stay where you are because uh, first I have to make sure that little noise coming through in the background <laughs> is gone as we take our halftime break in the 9 o'clock hour. In studio with Senate President Craig Blair, Matt Miller, John Gilstrap co-hosting today. Let's talk about the failure to get a discipline bill out of education and signed by the governor this year. I know they proposed one. It moved along pretty well, and then it died. What happened? Oh, no, wait a minute. It got out of education. Yes. <laughs> it died in the House floor. It did. Um, but before we go there, uh, Amy uh, Grady, the education chair for the Senate, has been on here. And you guys mm -hmm. show her a lot of love when she comes on this show. She was very good. <laughs> <laughs> She's a school teacher, so in fourth grade, so I've got a soft spot in my heart. My, mm -hmm. my wife's family is all school teachers to begin with. Well, the re reason I bring that up is that there's a reason why she's the education chair and the first education chair that's a true educator since the 1960s. And even that could be argument. It was like a gym teacher or something like that. Coach. Hey, gym teachers are teachers, too. Dude, I, I shouldn't have said it like that, but it was like a coach. Uh, you I can believe I, that if you want. I think that's, I think that's nice. <laughs> kickball time, kickball time. Let's go. Uh, I shouldn't have went there. But, uh, um, but it, yeah, to, you know what? That, that was uh, next to unemployment. That was probably my dig biggest disappointment, mm -hmm. not, not getting across the finish line. And the reason for it is, is that uh, I talked about this a good bit over the previous months, and uh, it, it, we did a poll. And uh, so WVEA and uh, WVEA had like 700 respondents, and we, we did our poll uh, through the Department of Education of the Senate uh, and the House leadership. Uh, we get uh, working very well with the State Board of Education, and we had the State Board of Education send the poll out. That was their number one item, and over 2,200 teachers returned that survey. The number one item was the discipline in the classroom. It wasn't how much they got paid and things like that. You know, that made me feel really good that the teachers were saying, help us us be able to do a better job in the classroom and the disruptive student makes it so that a teacher has to teach to the lowest common denominator that must change so i started going around and asking people how many people remember pruny town i'll ask this in this room here you remember pruny mm -hmm. town we, yeah we wouldn't have been around for it yeah well t t most people do not remember except um, for the older mm -hmm. and you don't look near as old as <laughs> what most of the people raised their hands but i was threatened with pruny town let me tell you what mm -hmm. it straightened craig blair right out because i knew i didn't want to be removed from my school from my family from my friends was it a real place it sounds like one of those scary mm -hmm. made-up no. places no yeah. it was <laughs> real mm -hmm. And uh, it, they would take you there when you were the disruptive student, and it helped maintain control in the classroom. But not being around for it, I mean, he, was, he grew up in Virginia, and I grew up in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, Pruny Town was the Schumann Center. It's, it's, you got removed from school and sent out somewhere mm -hmm. else. So you had a threat. Yeah. Right. And, and so this is one of the things to a greater degree that is actually missing in our classroom now is the ability to extract the disruptive student for whatever the reason is and then get that student into a, um, a process, a classroom, an educational path that works for them and it does not draw down the other 20, 25 students that are in the class. And by doing that, it actually makes people that are borderline disruptive, and that would have been me, of to where I behave myself and I get back to doing what I was supposed to be doing, learning. And it makes the teacher's life easier. And so Amy crafted a bill and, and worked that through, and it died in the last minutes. I'm hoping 
that we can get that back on the call in the May special session because the the votes were there to be able to manage that. Uh, and I believe that we can get that done. And if it doesn't, then it needs to be done first thing, and it'll be right out of the chute of to, to next year to be able to, to get that across. Because the speaker and I both agree, most of us agree, but it, it was the process that got bound up on that. Some of the minority, the Democrats, didn't particularly like that. But I'm sorry. Uh, we know what we're doing is not working. There's also this thing called Star Academy. And I was not aware of that until September, October last year, where this is a private institution that comes up and sets up a school within a school. And that you can, you're able to take that student out of that classroom, move them in, have specialized teachers and counselors to be able to help that student. You know, we don't want to leave any children behind, uh, but you got to be able to teach them the way they need to be taught and how they learn. And then you think about the home environments that they're dealing with, especially with the opioid demic, uh, epidemic and parents not knowing how to parent. This would have been a tool that would have been able to allow the teachers to go back and do what they're best and take the stress level off the teachers. It's not all about pay. Uh, these teachers are there because they want to teach their children. They love that art of doing that. And not everybody's cut out for it. I certainly am not cut out to be a teacher. Uh, but there are people that love that and want to be able to do it. But you cannot have somebody in there of uh, cursing you all day long, threatening to kill you, threatening to do all these crazy things uh, that's taking place. Then the other students, the class stops. The learning experience stops while that teacher is having to deal with that student. I see you as a great teacher at Prunytown. <laughs> <laughs> I, d d d d I just pulled it up i just pulled up a picture of it yeah. the industrial school for boys oh my goodness mm -hmm. well d d and d d again d d i've said this on the show many times i learned with my hands i was bored in the classroom mm -hmm. and d d d we have to actually identify the students that are academics and teach them academically and let them learn as fast as they can learn if they want to go to school 365 days out of the year let them they're sponges for knowledge, and they learn that way. I, on the other hand, and a lot of West Virginians are like me, we are applied learners. That means that I learn math by learning how to bake a cake or cut lumber to frame up something, and you do the math, and, and you learn how to do things with your hands, and I've done that a lot throughout my life of on doing that there's a lot of us like that and the school system falls short in that category sometimes of and, and then you've got the disadvantaged and those are the ones that are the vulnerables uh that could fall into either one of those other categories but the home life or how they're wired of is got them at, at at a disadvantage and they need to have special attention this bill would have allowed that process to begin and be able to make all those things work. And keep in mind, and um, we've got to, uh, the K through three program where we're putting aids in the classroom and we'll be moving into this year having the third segment of that uh, where the third grade will get the aid in the classroom. And these kids, even the disruptive kids, will actually have an aid in there that can actually help with that to calm that student down or to take that student out of the, during that time period so the teacher can keep moving forward. But sometimes you've just got to get that. It's long term where you got to get the kid out of the classroom for more than a couple hours or a couple days. Uh, you got It really does take specialized care. And we're, the teachers are seeing more and more of that. Uh, throughout this state. I guarantee you that our um, education attainment will improve greatly by doing all the things that I just got done talking about. There. We're a year into this program at, at the lower grades, right? Two, two years. Two ago. years into it. Have we seen pushback from, from parents whose children are the disruptors and are being taken out of the class and such and are they upset i have not heard a single thing about that everybody that i've talked to thinks this this is a great idea the only problem with it is is that you only have so many of these aids that are out there and so that you run short 
on the aides on being able to fill all these positions. That's it. And you rob from one place to another because people could be working another job somewhere else and then they move into that road then you leave a vacancy back there but guess what that's also life too that happens in the private sector public sector of but what you're trying to do is to solve problems and you always have another crop of whether they're graduating from high school a ctc or a university there's always another crop coming up of employees of citizens taxpayers whatever you want to call them in this case teachers and teachers aides matt miller is there a way to cut back on some of the paperwork that teachers deal with and and that seems to be another issue that teachers want to teach but there is so much bureaucratic stuff that they have to take care of that it takes away from that opportunity to prepare and be in the classroom the way they'd like to yeah, part of that is on the federal level and part of it is on the state level. We've had a lot of discussions about that. Of You have to keep in mind, though, that that bureaucracy also is from a litigious society as well. So you have to be able to document everything that's out there. And some teachers spend way too much time of having to document that stuff. And um, Michelle Black is the superintendent state superintendent she's great uh right now our superintendent and our board is great uh in the state of west virginia they recognize that and they are working on processes to being able to streamline that and make it so the teachers are getting to do what they really sent there to do educate and another thing that can be done is to get it into a more of electronic format and that is happening as well to where when you're doing the document and that you can actually go through and click, click, click and put special notes in and move on. And so my permanent record was always down at the principal's office and it was like a folder where I would see everybody smiling here because I think that's it's an way. encyclopedia is what it was. Volumes. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about you or me? Maybe both. <laughs> but when, you know, when I went to school though, you really had to do something pretty bad to get booted out because when we got in fights all the time back when I was growing up and then you go to the principal's office, which was a nun in my case because it was Catholic school, and then you either got you know whipped with something or they, you make you shake hands and then you went back to the classroom. It was pretty rare that it got elevated to the point of expulsion. Yeah, well, corporal punishment doesn't take place anymore. Correct. That's the secondary uh, issue. There. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's one. But I can remember the, of one of the students, I was in third grade, I believe I was, and he was hanging off the monkey bars, and the teacher told him to come off the monkey bars, and he was a stocky kid. And everything he hung with one arm he come around slugged her and, and knocked her glasses off and put her in she had a black eye and he went to pruning town yeah well that's deserving i never hit a teacher yeah but but that type of stuff did take place then but i think it's way more prevalent now and then, it is and, and part of it is is that there our society has become more tolerant of those behaviors let's call them deviant behaviors mm -hmm. of and that's got to stop and this is why a lot of kids send their uh, or parents send their children to private schools to send their kids to the christian schools of uh, because there is a, of greater t charter schools there's greater freedom of to be able to manage the students of there versus what it is in the public school system to where you have these rules and guidelines that come from both the feds and the, the state department of education and remember i think it was amendment four failed uh because that was on making so that anything that the state de or the department of education put out had to go through the rulemaking review process to where an elected official would actually have a final say on that. And in this case, it would have been the legislature. There are only two things that I know of in the state of West Virginia that doesn't go through that process, and that is the State Department of Education and the health departments. And so elected officials ought to always have the last say of on things that are taking place on that. Nobody should ever be appointed to be in a lawmaking authority. That is not the way our government is set up. Uh, but this is how it takes place here. And you, you heard me. I just got done talking about 
I believe our State Board of Education and the superintendent is some of the best that I've seen since I've been in the legislature. Of But times change. People come and go. The appointments change on that. And so the, you need to have that check and balance in there to be able to make it work. I'm sorry I went back would, to would you Would before. you favor State Board of Education positions being elected statewide as opposed to appointed? No. Uh, because I think that that's a problem as well. Uh, and because then it becomes a popularity contest rather than trying to get people that's uh, in there that, that, does, that can do a good job uh, for the people of West Virginia. And keep no, make no mistake about it, then to, to your teacher unions, for instance, would be fielding candidates for every one of those races. They'd be well-funded from that standpoint. The next thing you know, you'd have the, the WVEA or the AFT running the state of West, West Virginia's education system. That's the last thing that you want as well. Uh, so that's where the, the, having the appointment process and then they make the, the, the do the rulemaking and, and go through the rules process like all the other agencies. But when it's over and done with, it's in effect because it's called emergency rule. They can do something immediately. But for it to stay in place, it actually has to come over, go through the rulemaking review process, which, by the way, we're nationally recognized as being one of the best. And if the federal government wouldn't have abdicated their duties, like to the DEP and other places, we wouldn't have the problems we have in the federal government. But then it comes through the whole rulemaking review process, and we bundle them up because most of them are inert. That we everybody just agrees 100 percent, but they've went through the process with a fine tooth comb, making sure that we've got the right things in place for them. And then if there's something that's a problem, we pull it out, we work it separately, we do amendments to it, we have the final say. We find out why they're doing what they're doing, or we stop what they're doing, or in most cases, we okay with what they're doing. I just want to jump back to the education side as far as uh, students that may not be built for the classroom, students that may create troubles in the classroom. There is the Mountaineer Challenge Academy in uh, in the Preston area. Uh, has that been looked at as something that could be expanded to allow those types of opportunities? It has been expanded to having the second one. Okay. But and still just two. Is that enough at this point in time, or is that something that could be expanded even further? There's a possibility of doing on that uh, actually Mountaineer Challenge Academy when everybody was opposing the charter schools that's exactly what it is with a different name <laughs> uh, and so the Challenge Academy is an absolute success in the state of West Virginia and uh, it, you got we just the expansion is taking place I think that they just graduated the first class right. I think I hope education's not my specialty <laughs> okay where's it located uh, by the it's way. in southern West Virginia okay. and um, so the answer to your question is is that we will be looking at it further to being able to do it but you got to be able to have the demand for the students to go in there mm -hmm. and ultimately do we really want to take that's where you say it's a, a child that's in Martinsburg and you're taking them to another part of the state. That is drastic, and that's what Prunytown was. That right. was drastic of on that. Uh, even I would like to see something when you got a population base like we do here in Berkeley County, where Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan County could all come together and create a specialized school for doing that. And I think our Berkeley County Board of Education does some work right now on trying to be able to get the student out of the classroom doing that. So I applaud them for that work. But it needs to be done throughout the state. And <clears throat> I respectfully submit that Amendment 4 died at the hands of an editor. That was so densely written. I voted against it simply because it, it took so long and with so many words it was so difficult to get through. I recommend you go at it again in plain language and just make it a... a simple amendment to read and put it out because I think its intent was terrific, but just to plow through it was so difficult. It was so much easier to say no than yes. Amen, my brother. Uh, look, we're, this is a learning experience for all of us. This year we had some constitutional amendments. I ended up down at the Secretary of State's office and I said, here's the bill. Tell me what it's going to look like on the ballot. 
Like I, and then we actually had sample ballots on what those constitutional amendments would look like. Now, only one of them went across, made it across the finish line. But we were able to see what they would look like. And if I couldn't read it and understand it, because I'm, I'm the same way. And, but lots of those things go through the judiciary and go through finance. And you look at them, and you never get to see. You're, you're seeing it in the bill format, but you did not get to see what it would have looked like on the ballot. And I went back upstairs to, with my chief counsel. I had this biggest smile on my face. And I said, I have cracked the code. I've cracked the code to figure out what the Secretary of State's office is going to do, where they extract the verbiage from the bill to be able to get this done. And so, but you're spot on. Uh, because, and then when in doubt, vote no. Legislators do the same thing. If you're not sure on what you're voting on, the safe bet is to vote no. The people in West Virginia, uh, along with a relatively well-funded campaign, uh, did a good job at whacking all four of them. One of them was even in practice uh, when it dealt with the churches. So we're going to see these constitutional amendments back uh, because it makes for better government long-term, long after every one of us here is set in, in, in here dead and gone. Uh, because the world has changed around us. We live in the 21st century now. The world's electronic. The world's different. We must be able to adapt. Actually, we must be able to anticipate what the future's going to be and be able to predict that and then put the things in place to grant success to our youth, to our people, so that they can have the prosperity. 60 seconds, Craig. Uh, best bill that passed that we haven't talked about. Best bill that passed. Oh my God! That we haven't addressed yet. I'm, I can only tell you about stuff that didn't get passed. I had to, I'm going to go with the budget because we didn't get to unemployment here today. And no, that, and that, that did is, not get passed either. Uh, that, that one did not get a. Well, actually, it did pass. Uh, but t the thing is, is it only stabilized. Uh, I can't call that the best bill that passed because we're still bleeding three million dollars a month. At, with record low unemployment in the state of West Virginia out of our trust fund. That trust fund must be stabilized so that we can be able to attract more businesses into the state of West what Virginia. What does this bill do to stabilize it? The, this bill, what it did was is it put a cap on the increases to, of just like it had before from 2009 to 2022 on what the maximum benefit is paid out. And then it also put a cap on what the employers pay up to. And it's $9,500 is what the employers pay up to. It was 9000 It used to be $12,000. Uh, we are way out of line with our other states. So we got to be able to get with it. Thank you. Appreciate the time. You're welcome. Senate President Craig Blair at 957.